to an inside look at the legendary Donnie Burns MBE and Heidi Burns. I'm Victoria Regan and I am here with them both in hopes of getting a deeper insight as to how they think. To get to know the person behind the facade of the champion or celebrity is always fascinating and often surprising. It's my pleasure to introduce Donnie and Heidi Burns. Heidi, by the way, will be joining us a bit later in the interview. Okay, this is a big one. Title number three, MBE. Ah, okay. So um, that was probably um, one of the, the second greatest highlights in my life. It was the second greatest highlight in my life. Um, when Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth gave us the MBE for Outstanding Services to Performing Arts. That's the official um, title. And it was the most incredible occasion. It's a milestone in somebody's life. The great thing is my mum and dad were there to see it. Again, as mum and dad, so I can only imagine now as a parent how that must be. Um, you know, and it was fabulous, Vicky. And for services to, uh, outstanding services to performing arts is something I think that most people can get their heads around, but they might not know that it was not all of the story. Um, actually, you've got a gift because you open people up. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll open up. Um, in my hometown of Hamilton in Scotland, Scotland's only a nation of 5 million people. Hamilton is a small town, uh, about 11 miles from Glasgow. That was my hometown. I went to, to school there. And what happened was, um, I spoke, I've spoken about the giving back and uh, how this has been, I wouldn't say brainwashed, but ingrained into my soul, into my psyche. So Gain and I were so lucky and so blessed and life gave us so much, came from having not even a television, to flying all over the world, doing shows at the Budokan or the Tokyo Dome, 33,000 people each night. And we would work in Japan every Christmas. Japan was very good to us. Japan and Germany actually helped to make us. And um, we would come back not until the 22nd or the 23rd, of, one year, the 24th, Christmas Eve, we did a show in Gaynor, never forgive me. So that was the only time we ever did that show, which made me promise never again. So we you'd normally come back about 22nd, 23rd of December. And I'd drop Gaynor off in Manchester in the car and I'd drive up to Scotland. And what I used to do is I used to go to Garden Abel Children's Hospital on Christmas Day. The day before on Christmas Eve, I'd go into the, the big cash and carries or the wholesales and I'd buy um, about six foot high, uh, bin bags, trash bags of toys for kids. And it was my way of giving back my luck because I felt so blessed. And um, I'd spend Christmas day with these kids who were in the terminally ill ward. And I would just spend Christmas day with them for about five or six hours and bring them presents that they couldn't have because it was going to be the last Christmas. Uh, it would tear my heart and soul out, but it was the only way I could get back. And uh, so I did that for about six or seven years. And my mum was friends with a, a counselor called Nancy Cochran, because my mum and dad were both school teachers. My, my dad taught music and art. My mother taught remedial kids and uh, kids with autism. And uh, this Nancy Cochran wrote to Downing Street saying, about the charitable work that I did, but I, I, I didn't want people to know, actually. I, I, I know people might be sitting at home saying, oh yeah, I really did, I've never said it till now. And I did that every year. Um, little bald kids who are going through chemo. And uh, that was part of the reason that we got the MBE as well. That was why we got on, uh, there's an honors department. And that was how we first came on the radar, was because of the charitable work. But we did, and also when there was the Pan Am flight that came down over Lockerbie, we did shows to raise funds to uh, rebuild the uh, children's playground in the school in Lockerbie. So there was a lot of stuff going on in the background that people don't know about. I don't really talk about this. It's the first time I've ever spoken about it in public. I'm 63. Um, and I was, I don't know what age I was at the time, 26, 27, something like that. Um, and um, that was actually what put us on the radar. 
And of course, then also for uh, the outstanding services to performing arts by winning, by being lucky enough to win the titles that we did. Thank you for sharing all that, Donnie. I think it's very heartfelt and certainly an incredible way to give back. It's important when you get people who have got talent and they don't have the money. Lessons are expensive, but our prices are expensive. Yeah. There's a lot of money in the dance world, um, but at the same time, there are a lot of kids with a lot of talent and no money. And you know, it's always important to try and nurture them as well. Uh, because I had it given to me, and the deal was I had to get it back. This is a big one, and I take a deep breath because the responsibilities that come along with this one, that is the fourth title, is huge. WDC president, 16 years so far. Ah, okay, that one. <laughs> uh, that's how I think, I, mean, I, I don't know, you can never judge yourself too close, you can't, you know, subjective, subjectivity, but that's how I think people define me, especially on social media. Donny Burns, the WDC president. And, uh, um, it's great to serve again and to give back to all those countries, you know, 60 countries worldwide, plus some others. Um, but actually, to tell you the truth, Vicky, I never wanted to do it. Now, I, again, people might be sitting at home thinking, oh yeah, uh, you know, you planned or plotted your way there. I only ever wanted to dance. All I, even now, all I want to do is be with the dancers. I swear, you can, you can ask Heidi. Um, I was at Blackpool. We were dancing on the Wednesday in the Pro Latin, and Brian McDonald, who uh, is the president of the NDCA, Brian and Christy McDonald, everybody knows Brian and Christy. I've known him since we were all in Scotland. He saw me since I was born. And he came up to me at Blackpool in the Winter Gardens Ballroom, and he said to me, We've got a, a WDC, ICBD, it was called at the time, meeting, and I want you to come. And I said, you must be joking. All I want to do is dance, Brian. I want, I'm doing my samba rolls. I've got my samba rolls on Wednesday. They're not working. I'm not going to any political meeting and putting a suit and tie on. He said, no, 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 I need you there. He said, they're thinking of throwing Scotland off. They're going to take the country of Scotland out. So, of course, I would go for that, Vicky, because Scotland's only five million people, and I've represented Scotland all my life. I'm proud of my country. Um, same as, you know, Americans are. I'm proud of Scotland, my little country. So I had to go. And then I went to this meeting and, uh, you know, said my piece for Scotland. Uh, Scotland did not get thrown off. And then I was roped into it and Brian uh, took me on to the dance sport committee. Uh, he became the first dance sport chairman. But he basically pulled me by the ear to get there. I didn't even want to be in that. And then after, um, Oh, five or six years, Brian was a fabulous dance board chairman. A guy from Germany, Gerd Weisenberg, was the vice chairman. I was a vice chairman. And, you know, I represented the competitors and their views then. And um, overnight, Brian McDonald resigned. And so I then became the chairman. And after being a few years of chairman uh, of the dance board, they wanted me to run for president. And I I wanted to run for president as much as I wanted to write a damn technique book. I didn't want to do it. It wasn't me. Um, but they just said, we really want you, we, we need you to do it. I know this sounds cheesy, but I didn't want to do it, Vicky. Uh, the two presidents before me were Robert Schott and Karl Breuer from England and from Germany. They were older and more mature and more experienced than I was. I was young. I was in my, I think it was in my forties, and nobody had ever been the president in the forties. And I'd gone so far now, I don't get on ships very easily, but I don't jump off them. So I did it, and then I've been there since then. But it wasn't something that I wanted to do. It was something I specifically did not want to do. It's so funny that you keep doing things that you did not plan or didn't particularly want to do. But here's the next question. It's a two part question. After 16 years, are you happy that you took on that position of WDC president? And with that, how was the Amateur League developed? Sure, again, very good questions. Am I, I didn't want to do it, dragged, kicking and screaming all the way. 
Am I happy that I did it? Yes, absolutely, Vicky. Because once again in life, I've learned um, that it's been good for me. It's helped to form, well, first of all, I've been able to get back um, a lot of time, a lot of stress, a lot of work. Uh, people have been very trusting to me. But I've also learned to develop a different mentality. You know, when you're on the floor and you're dancing and you're winning, you have a certain mentality. You have to be completely different. You, your brain has to change. It changes your brain. You have to serve people. Their opinions become more important than yours. You know, I'm elected to represent their interests, not my own. Um, and it's taught me so much. It's taught me about some patience that I never had. Uh, I still don't think I have enough. Uh, but certainly I wouldn't have had any <laughs> if it had not been for that job. I've had to take other people's uh, views on board, uh, go their way against my own judgment very often. Um, and that's been a good thing. Uh, it's taught me how people are, uh, different cultures, um, different problems in different countries. I'm extremely honored and blessed to have been able to represent the World Dance Council and build it up. I think we've built it up. When, when, when I, before I became president, the World Dance Council had about 6,000 pounds in the bank and now we have over a million dollars so uh, it's not all about money and we've and again we've been able to use that through covid to give back to the dancers we we set up a thing where dancers in trouble could apply and we sent them money we sent them food we sent them vouchers but we sent them hard cash and it saved a lot of people in a lot of countries um, of course you can never do enough we don't have those kind of funds but I've been able to do that. The Amateur League is all about giving back as well. We, um, it got to a period around 2003, I think it was, where all the, we saw children being prevented by another federa federation being stopped and bullied from competing. They were told they couldn't go to Blackpool, couldn't go to the UK, and they couldn't go to the international. And all these great British championships, uh, you know, Blackpool's like a Wimbledon, of dancing and these kids were being bullied and intimidated their parents like my mother had three jobs as I mentioned all these parents who are working so hard for their kids to dance were being denied uh, uh, banned and punished in their own country for dancing in these open events so after a couple of years um, I was taken to Kiev by two guys Sergei Rupin and Stanislav Popov both Russia and they took me to Kiev, and we saw another uh, federation called the IDU, the International Dancers Union. And they were prepared to work with us and ex accept our professionally qualified judges, which had been, there was a thing called the General Agreement where the IDSF and the WDC had made a general agreement where they would recognize professional judges as qualified, which of course they are. And then they suddenly ripped it up. And the IDU, this new organization were prepared to recognize only our judges. And they had 5,000 couples, Vicky. 5,000 couples outside the system. So we went back uh, to the WDC and offered the WDC to take the IDU in as our amateur side. And they refused. They wouldn't do it because they didn't want to have a war with the IDSF. So we said, we're offering it to you. I work for the WDC. I'm offering it to my federation. If you don't want to take it, we may well take this and run with it on our own because we think it's the only viable alternative to save our bacon. And that's what we did. We formed the Amateur League to give kids freedom, to give them an alternative. And that's why it's been successful. You know, you mentioned that you thought people would listen to this and say you did orchestrate this position. So do you think that people see you as a power mogul? And I don't know how to address it, really. Um, I've only ever wanted to dance and help dancers. And I, have, I do speak up if I think something's wrong or if I think it could 
should be changed or we can change it, I say it um, to make things better. Um, and I don't like injustice. I, I, I've never been it probably because of my, my childhood, I never like to see people bullied. That's, you know, let's go back to the amateur league again. We saw all these kids being bullied and pushed around and their parents and, and I can't stand that. Um, and I don't like it if it's political or, uh, you know, uh, uh, either. So, no, I, I think people see me as arrogant. I have to say yes. Uh, does it give me pleasure to say that? Of course not. Uh, I don't think I am. Um, but I understand that maybe I, and certainly social media, have created that narrative. Um, that's for sure. But all I can tell you is, for a guy who was born in the back streets of Hamilton and Glasgow, who came up playing football and fighting to prove that he wasn't weird because he was a dancer, I cry a lot. And uh, I cry a lot because I feel a lot. Again, I never promote it. Um, we get emails, Facebook messages, Instagram messages from mothers and fathers of children several times a week saying how happy they are the kids came from siberia nobody knew them they came to disney or they came to dublin and now they were second in the world championship they were judged by ricardo and yulia and their dreams have come true we have that all the time you know we have little kids who are having their dreams come true and their parents are the proudest parents in the world um and if, if standing up for these people and, and, and not buying into people's BS, if that's arrogant, then maybe I'm arrogant. But I, I honestly don't think so. I don't think I am. You'd have to ask other people who know me.